broken together we're talking about and have been talking about our relationships we've been talking about marriage we've been talking about and we've brought you basically through from the introduction where you and your wife met right on through the process of learning of each other into of course uh, the anniversary we're talking about today taken from Matthew chapter 19 and um, question for you to ponder on and to think about this morning what does it mean to have an anniversary that honors God even though you're broken together? And you may be wondering, I don't understand the title. I don't understand everything about this, about being broken together, what all that involves. Well, just stick with me and I'll tell you. But first, let's just loosen you up and lighten you up a little bit this morning. Get a little story to tell you about a couple, a couple celebrating their 50th wedding. Any of you been married 50 years? It could be any one of you then, huh? Okay. Just think about these. Raise your hands again for the rest of us. Let's just look around and look and see who it is. Okay. And this probably fits one of these. A couple celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary was asked the secret to their success. The husband replied, the day we got married, we agreed that if an argument arose, I'd go out and stand on the porch until I cooled off. And it worked like a charm. 50 years of being outdoors and all that fresh air was exactly what this relationship needed. <laughs> well, if you've been standing and spending too much time out on the porch, let me give you a little hint here for you. Here are three ways to strengthen your marriage. And I don't think you ever get to a place in your relationship that you can't strengthen that relationship. I don't care if you've been married five months or five, uh, 50 years. It doesn't make any difference. The fact is, there's three things. One is commitment. All these start with C, and it's all in your little hand out there, so you don't have to write it down or look it up. It's all spelled out there for you. One is commitment. I think, you know, when you're in a marriage, and as you progress through marriage and in that relationship, commitment is an important part to it. You should never enter into the relationship if you're not committed to that person that you're marrying, meaning that you're putting your spouse above others. So many times, we take our families and we put them at the end rather than putting them at first. Of course, Jesus first in all things, right? Uh, Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. That is a priority. That is biblical and that's God's way. But secondly, we always, you should put your spouse above others today. And, and that's a demonstration of your love. The second C is concern. Um, I think concern may ask the question, what do you need? How can I help you? What can I do for you? How can I serve you? And you know, a lot of times as you progress through the marriage and the years click off and the pages and the chapters close uh, on different events and times in your life, many times you find yourself maybe less concerned. You just kind of get in a rut. You get used to each other, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the case, but Anyway, you get in a position where you're, you're just not showing the concern. And, and it's always a blessing to see couples that they still show concern and love and hold hands and, and are affectionate to one another and care for one another. And, and I don't care, again, how long you've been married, you can still do that. And the third C is not only do you have commitment, not only do you have concern, but the third one is coping. <laughs> Maybe this fits some of you. Um, you know... And when we talk about coping, it doesn't mean you tolerating your wife or you tolerating your husband. Uh, I'm sure none of you do that, right? Uh-huh. Okay. Coping, coping says we can work things out together. And that's an important thing that you do in your relationship, that you work together and that you seek solutions and that you lift one another up. I know a lot of times when you've got kids in your home, the kids will try to cause division and split the parents and their decisions and things. And uh, I was talking to a couple just recently, and, and I told them, I said, you've got to be unified in your home. You've got to be unified with your children. You've got to be unified one with another in order for your home to be successful. Because let me tell you, it's amazing the things that can come into your home and your life that can cause you to not cope well and to cause you to have difficulty and to cause you to have trouble. You've got to learn to work together, and that's crucially important. So I, I put it this way. Unless there are two winners in a marriage, there's none at all. You should both be winners in your marriage relationship. 
And, and I'm sure that through the years, that's important. I'm glad that I've watched Joe and Cindy. I married them seven years ago in their backyard. And I've watched them, and they have invested in coping. They've invested in commitment. They've invested in concern. And others in this church and people that I've married, it's always a blessing to see marriages that are working and how the young people and folks who've been married a little bit longer uh, work together to achieve those things, that they are winners in their relationship. Today, we're nearing a conclusion in the study that focuses on marriage, relationship, and family. And I think that is something that is necessary and crucially important that we bring to our attention within the, in the uh, area of our church and area of our families today. Marriage is not about the glamorous moments. And I know today that's many of the things that the world tries to appeal to to make marriage glamorous and things like that. But marriage is about the product of a lifetime of loving one another. And, uh, and that's really what makes it all work together. So God's priorities are very different from ours when it comes to marriage. And certainly in the conditions of the world that we're living in today, and we see the things that are occurring, you know, it seems like the family, the relationship, the marriage has really gone south. That people don't have that strong relationship in marriage like they used to have. And folks, we've let things distract us. We've let things divide us. We've let things create havoc in our homes and our families. And I found one of the most important things, listen, through this whole study that we've been talking about for several weeks, every week you hear about the necessity of having God first in your relationship. And you've got to have God first in your individual life. And if you're missing that, it's not going to work. I don't care what books you've read. I don't care who you've talked to. I don't care what uh, series you've been to, whatever. If you don't have God in your relationship, you're going to struggle. And you're going to struggle big. But it's the Lord that really makes the difference. Who you marry is less important than who you become together. And that's exactly what happens. It's not you lose somewhat your individuality. You're now functioning as a couple, as a husband and a wife. Why should we prize the anniversary? You know, all the attention. I've got a wedding coming up this, um, this Saturday. And... Um, and I'm sure, you know, this, it's going to be a great event and all the festivities and all the things that go around with that, you know. And we put all the emphasis on the marriage, the wedding, but the anniversary is, okay, it's an anniversary. And God forbid you forget it. I did one time. One time. I didn't actually forget it. I forgot the date. I got the date wrong. It was not nice. But hallelujah, it's wonderful when you kiss and make up. Amen. But anyway, why do we prize or why shouldn't we prize the anniversary more than actually the wedding day? Well, I'm going to give you some answers here. And I hope that these three lessons that I'm going to give you will help you to, to give you uh, insight on this. The first is the purposes of marriage are sanctified. Now, we're using uh, Matthew chapter 19 as our springboard today. Matthew 19, starting with verse 3. And this is interesting what we find reading in this reading. It says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, the Pharisees, you've got to understand the Pharisees, they accepted the fact that a man could divorce his wife. And there were some pretty far-fetched things that a man could use as an element of divorce. However, there was no provision made for a wife to divorce her husband. She was kind of stuck with what she got. <laughs> you ladies don't feel that way, do you? <laughs> Amen. Uh, they're not, yeah. They're not, I, I like the laugh there. They're not asking if divorce is permissible, but instead it's a question about the provision in the Old Testament law. Now, the question was not, can a man divorce his wife? The, the question was asked of Jesus, on what grounds can a man divorce his wife? And there's, there were some ridiculous reasons offered. If you'll read back through the, the historical part of, of biblical times, I mean, it, some of the reasoning and rationale was absolutely absurd. But honestly, if you look at some of the reasons that couples divorce today, it's about as ridiculous I mean, today, people divorce over just some of the craziest things, and some of them enter marriage with some of the craziest ideas about marriage. The people in Jesus' day held to the Hillel law, 
The Hillel law, people in Jesus' day took marriage about as serious as people take marriage today. So in essence, times haven't changed a whole lot, have they? God uses marriage as a, and let's get this right. He uses marriage as a sanctifying tool within the relationship. Sanctifying means to be set apart for a purpose or use. So it's, it's through the efforts of marriage today that God sanctifies us and that he grows us in our faith. You look at your spiritual life. Sanctification is an important part of your spiritual growth, isn't it? Well, sanctification in your marriage is also important too. The tendency today is to, is to run when things get tough or hard at home. Well, we can always get out of it. I've never understood how a person says, uh, I mean, you could have just eat her up or eat him up before you got married. And then after you get married, you wish you had. I just don't understand how people can. Y'all will get that in a minute. I don't understand how people can enter into a marriage relationship and be so over, head over heels in love with one another. And a couple years into the relationship, all of a sudden, the marriage, the love, and everything goes out the window. It's unbelievable. What happened? What happened to your love? Why did you win a marriage? Really, did you, was your love genuine to start with? So God uses marriage, and that's just some thought-provoking questions. God uses marriage to grow us in our relationship with him. Did you know that? God uses marriages to, re, to grow you in your relationship with he, God, if we choose to be broken together. And that's where you have to come. So there are two purposes behind marriage. And the first one is, the little check mark there is, marriage will help us understand and appreciate the gospel more. Marriage and the Bible has a direct connection. It had a direct connection in the, in the book of Genesis, right? The first institution that God founded was the home, was marriage, was a relationship. But who had to be in the relationship for it to be successful? God has to be. What happened to Adam and Eve? Well, they went to the garden and, and then they were enticed of Satan and they sinned. Yeah, but here's the issue. They laid God aside in their, in their relationship. They laid God aside in their life. And when you lay God aside in your life, you're going to sin. And you're going to make bad decisions. And the end result is you're going to get bad results. So we're reminded Paul compared marriage to a picture of Christ and his church. So, you know, you look at the importance of marriage. You've got to look at the importance of church and Christ. Because Christ being the bridegroom and the church uh, being the groom and the church being the bridegroom, Paul reminds us that by loving one another and even staying together, we, we picture for the world, we picture also for ourselves today just how much Jesus loved the church and how much the church was to follow Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus loved the church so much he died for it. And realizing he didn't buy, die for the brick and the mortar, we, the people, are the church. He died for us. He died for all humans that we could have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not always easy for a man to love his wife the way Christ loved the church. Now, Paul talked about in Ephesians 5 the way and the relationship. And I know many times we totally get this out of context about wives submit yourself to your husband and then husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church. And, and for men, sometimes it turns into trying to be a macho mentality. And for the ladies, it turns to be, it can turn into be, if you're not understanding it, it can be a negative. But that was not the intention here. Uh, teaching him, what he does, he teaches him about the relentless love that Jesus has for each of us today. And you've got to understand that God loves us with an everlasting love. There's no greater love than the love that God has for you and I today. Jesus loved the church so much that he devoted his entire life to the church. So it's important. And again, let me bring you back. Remember, the relationship of the church and with Christ. It's just like a marriage relationship. So, you know, he loved it so much that he died on the cross for it. He died on the cross for all of us. And therefore, he loved the church so much that he even promised to return for the church one day. And praise God, that's what we're looking forward to. We're looking forward to that great day when Christ shall appear. And we shall be taken out of this world and we're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb, the feast. And we're going to be with our glorious Savior forevermore. 
Man, that's going to be awesome. Hallelujah. The wife is a beautiful picture of how word that the Savior is to be followed. And Christ is to be followed. He is to be followed in your home, in your relationship, in your marriage. You've, uh, you've got to have Christ as head of your home. So when a wife follows her husband, it's a reminder of how faithful Jesus is in every sense of the word. Jesus has always been faithful to his church. The question that we have to ask ourselves, <clears throat> excuse me, just how faithful are we to him? How consistent, how committed are we to Christ? So Jesus would never lead you to a place that you should not go. He is, well, the psalmist says he leads you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, 23rd Psalm. So Jesus, this is what you've got to understand. Now, and I want you to flip this. Jesus always has our best interest at heart, doesn't he? Now listen, you should have your wife, your husband, your family always at the center of your activity and what you're doing. You should always have them basically in the best interest of your heart to, to give them your best. So many times we give our families what's left. We give our employers, we give other people the best of us. They see another shade of us, and then when we get home, all of a sudden we, we've reached this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde personality. When we're with other people that we're trying to impress, we have one stripe, and then when we come home, we let down the curtain, and we're just really who we are and what we are. Folks, that doesn't work. You've got to be who Christ has designed you to be. And you've got to let God, too, work you and fashion and form you into what he didn't listen he didn't save you to make you junk he saved you to make you a person that will honor glorify our glorious god your life is important to jesus christ so a wife's submission to her husband is a reminder today basically that jesus will never leave us nor will he forsake us and i'm glad that we have that relationship with him i'm glad he never walks out on his on his children on his church on his on his bride. And I'm glad today he's always there. The unfortunate thing is the husband at times makes it difficult for the wife to follow him. Sometimes men can be as stubborn as mules. And the women said, I thought, ladies, if you didn't take advantage of this, y'all got to wake up. That's a high standard of marriage today. And, and in spite of, of its difficulties. And I think every one of you at some place in some time in life that are married, you've had difficulties in your marriage. Maybe that never was coming to a point in a place of divorce or nothing like that. But you know, so you have different ideas and different personalities and different things. And all this stuff culminates into sometimes it can culminate into a conflict. But you've got to learn to work through those things together. But we see that in spite of the difficulties that, that are demonstrated or demonstrated for us, that the work of the cross, the work of the cross is hard. The work of the cross was costly. It cost God everything. Therefore, when marriage is in what we would call the most difficult places, it should remind us of how unwavering Jesus was in his commitment to the church. In the struggles, you've got to look to Jesus. Hebrews 12 and 2 who is the author and the finish of our faith. And then the second check mark is this. Marriage reminds us of the unselfish work of Christ on the cross. Jesus laid it all down for us. And you know what? You've got to learn today to crucify your flesh. It's not about you having your way. It's about you working together for the common cause of Christ or what he has for you. So when you look at Ephesians 5 and the command God gives us, I'm going to be honest with you. Some of those commands, and Paul made it explicitly clear, and he did not hold back. He just said it the way that it is. You know, when you look at that, sometimes that can be hard to accept and to swallow from that point. But when a wife chooses to submit to her husband, it is a sanctifying effort, friends, listen, in her life because she not only pictures the church being submitted to Christ, but she also pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's, it's important that we understand the sanctifying process and how important it is in our relationship. It's just not the wife that is sanctified by marriage. 
You understand, husbands are also sanctified. I know, guys, you didn't want to hear that, but you are. And, and you, you've got to put away your, your childishness and your childish ways. You can't bring those things to marriage. You, you've, you've got to leave mama at home. You've got to understand your home. You don't need to be running to mama and daddy about your home and your marriage and your relationship. I understand you don't divorce your family. I'm not saying that. But I've seen more homes wreak havoc by parents getting involved in their kids' marriage. And you need to keep your nose out of your kids' marriage. <laughs> That's kind of blunt, isn't it? But it's the truth. Now, if you see th something obvious that is heading in the wrong direction and can be costly, it's nothing wrong with putting checkpoints in there. But a lot of times, moms don't want to let go of her, their sons, and a lot of times dads do not want to let go of their daughters. And that's kind of the way it works. And you know that, and I know that. And you've got to keep your nose out of that business. That's, that's just part of it. And you've got to learn today that husbands need to not act childish. Wives do not need to act childish. You need to grow up and realize the seriousness and the importance, but also the joy that comes with a marriage relationship. Amen. My wife and I have been married 46 years. And um, I tell you, I thank God for the relationship she and I had through the years. And boy, I tell you, I brought a lot of stupidity into the marriage. But I'm glad with her grace, or God's grace and her help, I was able to share that stupidity. <laughs> and I think we both brought things. But, you know, God grooms you. He tools you. He polishes you, he improves you, and he bonds you, and your marriage becomes something that glorifies God. That, was, that had always been our intention. When a husband really loves his wife, he will work tirelessly into her sanctification in helping her. So through the husband's efforts to help his wife to grow in her faith, he also grows in his faith. Let's understand something here. The husband's supposed to be the spiritual leader of the home. Now, you think you got your big recliner, your lazy boy, and you got your little table, and you got your little footstool, and all the other stuff that goes with it, and you think your wife is supposed to be your... No. I knew I'd get one out of that one. You got to work together. You got to respect one another. You got to love one another. And, and you've got to be there for one another. Don't mistreat the most precious gift that you've got apart from salvation, guys, and that's your wife and your family. And the same thing with you, ladies. I mean, you've got to love each other. And men, if you will commit to leading your wife and being an example, then you will be forced to walk with God and you will grow too. So, so the spiritual growth process is an important part of the marriage relationship, isn't it? Ephesians 5, 28, 29, this is what Paul said. He said, so, men, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. So he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth, cherisheth, even as the Lord, the church. Man, listen. You, you've got to learn today to, to put you aside and you've got to lift up. Your husband will lift up your wife. Marriage will sanctify the husband. It will sanctify the wife. It will set you apart that God is glorified in your relationship. God wants to use your marriage to sanctify you because you've got to have God at the center, at the core. That's what you've got to build your relationship, your marriage, your life upon together. And with each passing anniversary, you should find yourself more like Jesus than before. You should be growing in Christ every day, growing in grace and knowledge of him. Let's go to the second point. The permanence of marriage is scriptural. So going back to Matthew 19, we pick up with verse 4 down through verse 6. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Well, I don't know what this transgender crowd is going to do with that, but that's what God said, and that's the word. And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. 
Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. So Jesus defines basically what he's doing. He's defining what marriage is. According to Jesus, marriage is between one man and one woman. <laughs> the, all this craziness that's going on in our world today and in our nation about men marrying men and women marrying women, that's in defilement of God's word. Uh, now, the Supreme Court may say it's okay, but let me tell you what, there's a court higher than that, and that's God's. And the God's court says it's not okay. So therefore today, listen, God made a man and God made a woman. And so therefore, that is what the marriage is supposed to look like. If God intended for us to have more than one spouse, he would have made, he would have made several eaves for Adam, but he didn't. So when God created marriage in the garden, divorce was inconceivable. <laughs> it wasn't even a possibility. So further we read in Matthew 19 and verse 8, he says, He saith unto them, Moses, because of thy hardness, here's, here's the point. This is where it all comes down to. Because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Jesus corrected their faulty thinking by saying, Moses never commanded divorce. He permitted divorce, but he didn't command it. And you've got to understand that. There's a difference between those two words. He, he permitted it because of the hardness of people's heart. All right, go to verse 9. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now you've, you've amplified the problem even greater. So Jesus is saying that the case of adultery is permissible for divorce, but it's not encouraged. Now, today, what people are citing for divorce is not biblical. You should go down and look at the court records of people that get divorces and see the reason that they get them. <laughs> it's pretty far-fetched. And as society, Dave, we've lost, honestly, I put it this way, we have lost all of our common sense. It seems like today we've lost our mind, that we have no thinkability anymore. Jesus only offered the reason for adultery, for divorce, and that is the result of a hard heart. So if we divorce for unbiblical reasons today, we commit adultery when we remarry. Now that's God's word. Please understand, and I'm not throwing stones today because, you know, many marriages have been affected by divorce. Those things have happened. So I'm not the judge of the jury, and I'm not condemning no one. I'm just saying, but even if the marriage begins with an act of adultery and consummating a new relationship or new covenant, it is still a covenant, isn't it? So God simply gives us a solution. He will forgive you, and then he wants you to submit yourself to the Lord, and you need to move on. If you're connecting yourself to your past all the time, you're never going to get to where God wants you to be. So, you know, I don't know of a person on this earth that has not made a bad decision. I don't know of a, of a couple that has not made bad decisions. I don't know of people that's maybe gotten into a bad relationship. Maybe that marriage was not made in heaven. You can't turn the clock back. Get God's forgiveness and go on. Because that's what God desires for you to do. 1 Corinthians uh, 7.15, Paul tells us, he said, and he gives us a secondary, actually, a secondary grounds for divorce. He says, but if the unbelieving depart, Paul said, let him depart. <laughs> And the lady said, a brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Now, understand this. If you're a Christian and you're married to an unbeliever, and it happens. Uh, actually, when Cynthia married me, she married an unbeliever. She thought I was a believer. But I was an unbeliever. But thank God that God touched my heart and convicted me. And brought me to salvation. 
But if you are a Christian, you marry an unbeliever, and an unbeliever walks out on the marriage, and it happens every day. Paul is saying, you're not in bondage to do that uh, if you do that. You're not, you, you're not in bondage. That's why he said, let him go. However, the Christians, they don't initiate divorce except in the case of adultery. But if, 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 the, if, if, if he walks out, what do you do? I mean, you pray and you hope, but we find in verse 10, the disciples respond and says, his disciples say unto him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, is it not good to marry? He's saying, well, maybe you should never get married to begin with. They're saying if, if there's no way out, way out, it's better not get married at all. But the, the many confused and conflicting ideas that we deal with in our day about what the Bible declares and says about on divorce are not caused by a deficiency in God's revelation. God is clear, concise in his word, but by the fact that sin has clouded men's minds to the straightforward simplicity of what God has said. We try to rationalize the word and we try to distort the word. You can't do that. You've got to take God's word as the word. And you've got to apply the word in its purest sense. Listen, you know why so many fail in their relationships? It's because they fail to involve the book of instruction in their relationship. If you learn to put the Bible as a vital part of your life, your marriage, your family, your home. Do you realize this book, this Bible has something to say about everything in life and even death? The problem is we don't consult it. Well, you can't expect the world, the, the unbeliever, to consult it. But the tragedy of it is Christians don't consult the God's word. Let me give you the third point. Maybe this will brighten up a little bit for you. The possibility of marriage, because that's been some heavy stuff we dealt with here. The possibility of marriage is satisfying. So because marriage is a picture of our relationship with Christ, let's consider the church, church's marriage to Jesus. Now, the Hebrew wedding, if you're familiar with anything about the Hebrew wedding, it has three phases in it. Let me just give them to you in a very simplistic form. One is the promise to marriage. The second is the, fest the festivities that lead up to the marriage. And then the third is the marriage itself. So the church has promised, was promised to Jesus. For on the cross, what did Jesus do? He purchased the church. He paid for it. With his, in, with his blood, and he gave his sacrifice. So the, that is basically the promise part. Jesus promised, and Jesus delivered. The second part is the festivities of the wedding will begin one day when there will be a sound from heaven, and the moment in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. We're going to a festivity in heaven, and man, it's going to begin when the rapture of the church occurs. And I don't know about you, I'm like John of old, even so come Lord Jesus. The ceremony will take place is what is known as the marriage of the Lamb. So realizing that today, we will be presented to Christ as a bride that is pure and holy. See the connection here? So many times we miss the point of marriage and the church and the picture that we're given by the Word of God. And that's why we don't take it seriously. God wants us to take our relationship in marriage seriously and he wants us to work at it and improve it and work together. But the only way that happens is when you first become broken together and you let Christ take over. So after the marriage takes place, we will experience this is going to be awesome. We're going to have an, an, an eternal, not once a year anniversary. We're going to have an, an eternal anniversary full of peace, joy, and celebration. Can you imagine what it's going to be like? When we arrive in that wonderful, glorious city of God, I see why Abraham said he was looking for, the, for a builder and maker about a city who was built by God. I can see why the church is so excited about the coming of the Lord because that's going to be when the bride and the groom come together. Hallelujah. And guess what? We're the bride. Amen. We may not look like it, but we are. So every sacrifice you make for Jesus will be worth it. Every commitment made to Christ will be rewarded. 
And so every problem that we've had will disappear. We don't go to heaven to talk about the problems we had on earth. Forever we will be celebrating with a bride, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to see him face to face and behold his glory. It is on this anniversary that you see your marriage begins to pay off. And you know what? Every time you have an anniversary, you should look and be excited about that and think about, man, this is great because my marriage is paying off. Amen. It is good. And on the wedding day, you hope for satisfaction. But it will, if you stay together, there is satisfaction. And you can't even imagine until you're there about what it's going to be like. As you grow older, you share. Listen, folks. You share the love that a lifetime has brought to you. And your love should have increased through the years. Regardless of how many years you've been married. Your love should have intensified, grown. I mean, you, you're just overwhelmed by it. Amen. You know, remember this? When you first saw that person that you married, man, there was a sparkle. There was a thump in your chest. There was something you just... I remember I was working at Sears and Roebuck while I was going to school in the shipping and receiving department. This little chick came through the shipping and receiving after she had clocked in. I said, my God, who is that? The guy I was working with, he said, that's Cynthia Baber. I said, man, I got to get to know Cynthia Baber. Amen. You know what? I thought I was going to get fired because I was spending more time in the candy department than I was spending doing what I was supposed to be doing. But I went where the sweets was at, and it was not the sweets. I'd always had an obsession with sweets, but let me tell you what. My whole obsession with sweets changed that day when I saw her. Amen. And man, I tell you what, it, it, it was sweet. And through the years of marriage and love, it remained sweet. You know, if it worked for me, it can work for you. Amen. If you stay together one day, this is a wonderful thing God's going to do. He's going to wipe away all tears. Revelation 21, 4. Through, though you're broken together, you realize that God has made something beautiful by putting you and your spouse together. He may not be the most handsomest thing in the world, and she may not be the most glamorous and beautiful thing in the world, but you know what? You can't judge it that way. They're important to you, and you love them and you honor them, and you thank God for them. So for those of us who have a spouse already in heaven, they are no longer broken. They're in the presence of God. And that's an encouraging thing today. I close with these, this question. Can you say today that you have been blessed by being broken together? It is so crucial that you are. And God will honor you and bless you in your marriage and in your walk and in your relationship. But don't forget, the key to a home that is successful and blessed of God is crowning Christ, head of your home, your relationship, your marriage. And it's an everyday thing that you do, that you seek the Lord and crown him Lord of your home. Father, thank you today for the moments that we've had to share your word. Thank you for homes and families and relationships. Thank you for your grace that is more than sufficient. Thank you, Lord, for each person that's been here this morning to hear this uh, teaching on Broken Together. And thank you that, Lord, that we can see you work in our relationship. We can see you bring about the fruit of that relationship and be honored in that relationship. I pray for each home in our ministry, our church. God, I just pray for each one here today that you will bless them and Lord, nurture them and take care and Lord, just always remind them the importance of having Christ first and foremost in your home, in your relationship and Lord, in our church too. We bless you this morning, O oh Lord, and we give honor, glory, and praise to your holy and righteous name. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's children said, Amen. Amen.